Good to be here, folks. Amen. Let me get my sight alignment here, my windage and elevation. Get this thing lined out right. All right. Yes, yes. Amen. All right. Father, we pray, Lord, for wisdom, understanding. We know, Lord, that knowledge comes from Thee. Our Father, won't you give us a little knowledge? Give us some wisdom, know how to use it. Give us understanding in your word. Give us understanding the times that we live. Where we are and who we are. 2020. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, turn the book of Revelation with me this morning, please. Chapter 13. probably one of the most familiar passages in the whole Bible for so many people because they spend you're dealing with the uh, Antichrist by the way the word anti can be used in two distinct senses anti in the sense that against Christ and anti in the sense that it is set over in contradistinction to Christ in other words another Christ true Christ, another Christ. So in one sense, against Christ, and he is. No question about that. But in another sense, the Bible says, let's compare the two. The Christ of God, the Lord's anointed, and this other thing that shows up. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 14. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. He had power to give life to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. So what does that come out to? Six, six, six. All right. Now go back with me. And I want you to notice something where the emphasis is put here. Let's start with verse 14 again. Notice how many times this shows up and the emphasis that we have on this. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to all them that dwell on the earth, they should make an, watch this, image of the beast. See that? Verse 15, had power to give life to the image of the beast of the beast. Now the Bible says in the book of Hebrews 1, the Lord Jesus Christ is the express image of God. We have two images here. We've got the image of the beast and we have the image of God, the Lord Jesus. The reason the Lord Jesus is the image of God is because he came to replace the fallen image of man, to restore that because man was created in the image of God God breathed his nostrils a breath of life. He became a living soul, body, soul, and spirit. And so when he fell, he lost to some degree that image, but not all of it. Because the prohibition to murder a man was directly connected with the man being made in the image of God in the Old Testament. That's why it's vastly different between killing a cow and killing a man. Still is. There's a big difference between the two of them. So-called science would have you believe that the only thing is they're both biological creatures and that's all there is to it. No, they're not. There's a big difference. But the image of God is a, therefore a direct reflection of God, right? His image. The Lord Jesus Christ was the very express image of God. He was God walking in flesh. And when God made the man... He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul, body, soul, and spirit. The man was made in the image of God. No angel, no cherubim, no seraphim, no creature, none whatsoever 
is ever referred to as having the image of God. Now we have an antichrist against Christ that shows up in Revelation 13 and it has an image and it forces the whole world to worship the image. Therefore we have a competing image. We have two images here. We have the image of God and then we have a competing image. And uh, I'm on the trail to something and there's a few things yet I've got to dig up and scratch around and find out about but it seems to me like the Lord's leading me into here something and I think I'm, I think I'm going to learn something about this because I'm on a trail. You ever, you ever heard about a bloodhound? Yeah. Yes sir, bloodhound. And, and there's something going on here. I'll give you a little bit of what I've got this morning and to show you, uh, show you, show you how important this is. If you notice it says in Revelation that this image, if you take this image, if you are connected with this image in one way or another, that it's doom for you, that there's no out, that you're in bad shape. And uh, it's something, therefore, that you need to be careful about. Be very careful. Now, let me warn you this morning. I'm not an alarmist, but I'm a pragmatist. I watch what's going on. I think that we should be doing that today. I warn you that we are in a, 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 a crossroads, a position now in our technology and our science and medicine where we're messing around with things that may very well affect the image of of God in man. We may very well be able to produce a man looks for all sense and purposes like any other man but he's not in the image of God because he's not fully a man. Now we are in a situation as far as learning is concerned it's what's called exponential growth. Now, let me give you a little illustration of what exponential growth means because this helps understand a lot of things. There's an awful lot of people that believe that linear understanding simply means that as it happened in the 1800s and we learn from the steam engine, industrial revolution, and all this happened, this and this and this and this, that it took it so many years for it to happen and then therefore we project into the future that if there's going to be any change, it's going to be the same way. It's going to take a, you know, a certain amount of time to do that. Exponential growth is an entirely different thing. And I want to offer you one of two things this morning. Will you take a million dollars right now or will you take a penny a day and double it every day for just 30 days? Just a penny. Start out with a penny. Which one would you take? Would you take the million dollars? That's a pile of money. Or would you take the penny a day? A lot of you know well what I'm, where I'm headed. Did you know that after 30 days, if you start with a penny, after 30 days you have 5,368,709 dollars. You say that's unbelievable. It's a fact, folks. It's a fact. Now here's what happens. With exponential growth, you get to a point that's called a threshold. And then all of a sudden from that threshold, it skyrockets. For example, this is 30 days, 5,368,000 and so forth. What would day 31 be? It would be $10,607,700,000. What would day 32 be? You see what I mean? It is exponential. and What that means is that all of a sudden it takes off and begins to move faster. When a certain amount of knowledge, uh, uh, the threshold, the threshold of knowledge is reached, from that point on, zoom, everything happens so much faster than, uh, than, than it ever has happened before. Now think about that, what I'm talking about, what we'll be talking about here this morning. You know the Black Death, the uh, bubonic plague, which is still around by the way, came through the world in the 14th century, that'd be the 1300s. They say it killed about a hundred million people. Now you think about the population of the world at that time. That's a pile of people. That's a bunch of people. A hundred million. They say that the flu that hit 1918, the, uh, came through the United States and the world, killed anywhere from 50 to a hundred million people. That's a bunch of people. And these are, these are uh, you know, they're uncertain about these figures. It could be more, it could be less. That's a lot of people. 
The coronavirus, COVID-19, COVID I think it's called, COVID-9 or COVID-19, the coronavirus is in its beginning stages. It's like the penny that's doubling every day. Right now it's in its beginning stages. Thousands have been affected. Hundreds have died or maybe even thousands. We can't depend on China for what they're telling us. Not at all. But we're in the beginning stages and that we may reach a threshold somewhere where all of a sudden it goes like this. Now, I'm, like I said at the beginning of the message, I don't want to be an alarmist. I'm not up here to scare you. But I'm a pragmatist. If I see red, I see red. All right. If this is blue, it's blue. Now, I may interpret this red and interpret this blue according to the scripture, but I'm not going to deny that this is red, and I'm not, not going to deny that this is blue. You see what I mean? I will interpret it according to the word of God. So we have a coronavirus. Now, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but just put that away in the back of your mind that there is a virus out there. I did a little research. <laughs> I went back to biology. And I tried to, tried to get the difference between a, bi a virus and a bacteria. You know, big difference between the two of them. A virus, they say, is a thing that lives in a gray area that's not really alive, but it's not dead. It's some kind of a thing that you can put it in a Petri dish and it can't reproduce. But you put it around a living cell and it has cell receptors where that cell can only, only certain cells can be affected by that virus. And it has receptors and they have to connect. And then once they connect, the virus literally goes in and takes over that cell. And then, of course, it replicates itself in your body and that's where your trouble comes in. So the virus is a real small thing. And it, some of them are very contagious. It appears that this coronavirus is a very contagious virus. Easily spread from one to the other. So now... Let's go back to, to, to what I started with. Man's made in the image of God. The Lord Jesus came into this world to restore that fallen image. He did. And one of the first benefits of the restoration of the fallen image is the fact that you're born again. Your spirit, now not your soul, your soul saved, but your spirit is born of the spirit of God. Therefore you've got God living in you. The Holy Ghost is in you, and that's the third person of the Trinity. God's living in you. And so therefore, you are, you are, uh, you have been restored to the image of God. Now, there, all that's left is the restoration, the, the, the redemption of the, of the purchased thing, which is your body. Romans 8 says that's going to be restored. 1 Corinthians 15 says that body, you're going to have a new body. So body, soul, and spirit in the presence of God to live forever. Well, wouldn't it be something if Satan, in his own, in his war with God? Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why does it keep on going? You ever ask yourself that question? How many people are going to die today and go to hell? How many people are going to, are going to die and wind up in the pit? I believe in hell, folks. I believe hell's for people that want to go there. How many people are going to die and go to hell? What if God just shut it off? That'd be it. Nobody else would be born. Nobody else would go to hell, right? So why, and it's him, not the devil, God is almighty God. And remember this, Satan does nothing outside of the permissive will of God. So why does he let it go on? I believe he does because there's a battle coming. I believe there's a confrontation that's going to come. I believe something's going to happen. Just like Wednesday night when I talked about the book of Job and I talked about the, the words that Job used, 1900 B.C., talking about a counselor and talking about an advocate and talking about a days man and all this between God and him because he knew something was going on. He did. He knew what he didn't, might not have understood all, but he understood something was going on. That he simply wasn't a pawn on a chessboard and they were playing with him. No, God wasn't playing with him. So what's happening? It may be that the Almighty allows Satan to get to the very point to where he can take a human being and look up at God and shake his fist in his face and say, look what I've done to the man you made. I've got a man, but he's not in your image anymore. 
Now think about this for a moment. If Satan can destroy the image of God in man, that is a direct assault on God himself. Think about that. You see, folks, this war, this battle is a much higher level than you going out and getting drunk. The devil may be do it. You don't need the devil to make you do anything. <laughs> this flesh will work you over real good if you don't keep it, uh, keep it in subjection. You walk with the Lord and stay in fellowship with God. I want to read something for you. This is from a man by the name of Kurtzwell. He's a he's a, a futurist. They call him. He's the man that invented the CCD, the charge couple device, the scanner, and stuff like that. So, you know, he's not just a blowhard. He's a very smart man, but he's not coming at this from a Christian perspective. But a lot of times that's good. A lot of times it really is. Preachers make a big mistake by listening to preachers all the time. Sometimes you need to get into the enemy's camp and sit around and listen to what they got to say. Yeah, you do. Listen to what he says here. He says, well, in a quarter of a century, non-biological intelligence. What's that? That's your computer or anything related to a computer. What is this G coming up next now? We're at G4, right? Generation 4, right? What's the next one coming up? G5. Have you ever thought about what's going to happen with G5? I just did a little research into this. Not a whole lot, but just a little bit. How many of you have noticed that the things that you can buy for your home now, so many of them are connected directly to the internet? You ever noticed that? Have you noticed all these cars and trucks now here, this stuff on the road that that's being guided by GPS? Have you, have you noticed that they're offering speeds now that connect to the internet that are far more powerful than what you've got already with your Wi-Fi? This is G5. This is only a scratch in the surface. It has to do with a exponential growth. You remember the exponential? It has to do now with we've reached the threshold and I believe we're starting up with exponential growth in the use of with uh, use of, of uh, technology that relates to computers and then it goes far deeper than that and we'll get into that in a moment but I just put that out for you to make you think because get your mind you know thinking in the direction that we're headed with this now listen to what he says within a quarter century nine non-biological intelligence will match the range and subtlety of human intelligence it will then soar past it because of the continuing acceleration of information-based technologies as well as the ability of machines to instantly share their knowledge. Intelligent nanorobots, we'll talk about them in a few minutes, will be deeply integrated into our bodies, our brains, our environment, overcoming pollution, poverty, providing vastly extended longevity, full immersion, virtual reality, incorporating all the senses, experience beaming, so forth, and vastly enhanced human intelligence. The result will be an intimate merger between the technology creating species and the technological evolutionary process it spawned. In other words, singularity. Now that's a big word that they use all the time at CERN. CERN, Switzerland. Singularity. They're reaching a point. But when this man's talking about singularity, he says, now I'm going to use the same term, but I'm going to apply it in a different direction. In plain words, he says that the technology itself is going to rise to the point to where we can't even comprehend it today. The communication ability, the ability to look into the human body, the ability to create organs, the ability to do things that are absolutely mind-boggling right now. But he says it's going to reach that point, and once it reaches that point, he says the man, technology on one hand and the man on the other, they're both going to reach that high level, and then they'll merge that singularity. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. <clears throat> singularity. Well, you're talking about... Preacher, you're talking about something that's a million years down the road. Remember exponential growth. Remember when they, Crick and Watson, 1953, when those two discovered, what did they discover? DNA. Crick and Watson. They discovered DNA. And when they discovered DNA, that blew the doors open. Because now... We can no longer, we don't have to just look at a, at, a, at, a, at a biological thing or something of that nature. Now we've got the code 
took them a long time. It took 14 years, 14 years to, 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 to chart the human genome. 14 years. 14 years to chart it, all right? That's a long time. It took 31 days to chart the genome of the SARS virus. 31 days. From 14 years to 31 days. In other words, they accomplished in 31 days what it took 14 years before to do. Now this exponential growth, what will it take the next time? How powerful will the computers be? Not just computers, what all is going on here? This is what the man's trying to tell you. He's trying to tell you that you're on the verge. I don't know if you are on the threshold yet, but we live in a generation that's going to see some change. When that bomb, August the 6th, 1945, exploded over, over, uh, over Hiroshima, Japan, nothing like that had ever happened. And Oppenheimer, after he, and he was, he was one of the major, major brains in it, Oppenheimer said after that, he said, I don't know what we have unleashed on mankind. And of course they dropped it, I think, two or three days later on Nagasaki, and then they brought the Japanese to, to the peace table, and on the USS Missouri, they signed in Tokyo Harbor, they signed the, the, uh, the peace agreement and ended World War II in the Pacific. And that never did happen. Nobody had any idea even what it, when it, when it exploded, folks, when that bomb exploded, most people didn't have any idea what was going on. They just knew it was a huge bomb. This is what's going on right now. Nanotechnology. What is nanotechnology? Nanotechnology is dealing with stuff you can't see with your eye. It is so small. It's a different world. And here's this man, he's talking about this. Remember though, the part I approached to you with when I started with, it, with this was, he, pro he approaches it from a purely secular point of view, all right? I'm approaching it from the point of view of a Bible believer, and how does this fit in the scripture? Remember, I'm a pragmatist. Remember, I cannot deny this is happening, but where does it fit? See, that's what we all should do. We don't just stick our head in the sand and say, well, I hope it goes away. No, let's deal with it. What's it leading to? For one thing, they want a radical extension of life. They want to live forever, but they want to live forever without God. See, that's the issue. That's where transhumanism comes in. That's a different thing altogether. They want to live forever without God. What's that done? If you can live forever without God and God is no longer necessary, then what does that do to God? You think he's going to let that happen? Of course it can't happen. Why? Because he is life and the source of all life. There is no life apart from him. He's life. But this, listen to this. A nanobot. How many of you know what a nanobot is? Some of you do. How many of you know what a robot is? Some of you are married to a robot, right? <laughs> all right. Think about a nanobot is a robot, but it is the size of a red blood cell. Or could even be smaller. Well, good night, preacher. You could stick something like that in your body. It's a point. You could put that in your body. Now, let's think for a moment. What if we could take a nanobot, inject it into the body, and it was pre-programmed to deal with certain viruses or certain bacteria or, or maybe the organs of the human body and to carry nutrients or, or to search out and destroy or whatever. What if we could do that? Wouldn't that be a remarkable thing? You say that's science fiction. No, it's not. Nanobots are blood cell, are red blood cell sized robots that can travel in the bloodstream, destroying pathogens, removing debris, correcting DNA errors, and reverse the aging process. Remember DNA, unwind it, you have a long strand. You go certain distance, you've got a gene, you go a certain other distance, you've got another gene. You've got a gene in here that causes a child to be born with Down syndrome, for example. Okay? That's a genetic thing. Precious little children. Got no choice in it. You love them, right? What if you could go in there and you could reprogram that gene to where that child would not be born like that? 
Would you do that? <laughs> it's quiet. <laughs> I'm not trying to I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to make you think. Because we are at that point. All right, and on and on and on it goes. How do you do that? You do that with a the technology they already have called CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR. The ability to slice and so forth and manipulate and produce uh, a gene or so forth from DNA and, and, and it gets technical and I'm old, I can only go so deep into this stuff because I don't have any training in that area. I have to read and ask God to give me wisdom when I'm dealing with it. I read a paper yesterday. I, sp I spent an hour on the internet reading uh, biologists and geneticists and I read for an hour what they had to say. I digested maybe 50 to 60 percent of it but here's what I got. Here's what I got. If you, if you type into the internet this afternoon when you get home the, uh, the coronavirus, here's what you'll get. The news media throughout the world, for the most part, says that the coronavirus is a virus that, uh, that uh, uh, was, uh, is something like SARS or like uh, flu or what have you. It just emerged. Okay, it emerged. Now that's what you're going to get. That's the news media. All right. I wanted to know what the doctors had to say. So I got on the website and here's what I found. I found that there's a lot of disagreement. They don't all agree, not at all. No, they don't. But there's a lot of them on there that say, don't be too quick to say that it just emerged. It may be man-made. Now this is coming from, we're talking, this is not, hey boy Connor, these are the, these are the scientists, the doctors. They talk at a much higher level. I just have to, I've got to decipher what they're saying and make an application of it. So here they are. They're saying, don't be too quick. What does that mean? That means that if it is engineered, if it is a virus that is engineered, it's a virus that was created, it's a virus that used all of the genetic manipulation, the genetic coding and all of that to produce a virus. Now, what's that virus doing? Where's it, make it, where's, where's, it, where's it making its strongest impact? China. China. Remember, China is a communist country, and the media is controlled over there. You're only going to get what, you, what they want you to hear. And we have no idea what's going on in China. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet, and you can, you can trace it down, where they're saying, the people over there are saying, the Chinese, if they can get it out somehow or another, they're saying it's a lot worse than you're here, they, that you're hearing, and so forth, and that may be true. But the bottom line is this. If man can create a virus, he can program that virus. He may be able to program that virus, and you know that DNA, now, uh, DNA, look at us. Look at us. You remember I told you at five and a half, six weeks, this, you're, you're about the size of a pinto bean, right? And your heart starts beating. That's the first organ in your body that starts beating. You're about the size of a pinto bean. Now look at yourself right now. What happened to you? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to get some of you to loosen up. <laughs> we're, we're not going to explode in here. <laughs> but is, doesn't that amaze you? Really? Doesn't it? Really? Doesn't that? You can hold a human being in, like this in your hand six weeks. Well, what happens to that human being? Exponential growth. All of a sudden, it passes a threshold, and. It, and that's what happens, all right? So here we are. We're at the point where they are, and I say we, pragmatism, humanity. We're at that point where they are manipulating, controlling the genetic structure of viruses, DNA. So what did I mean, preacher? I'm telling you this. Every human being on this earth has their own DNA. But that DNA can be traced to a certain race, certain region certain family. Are you following me now? This is where you get into biological warfare. When you begin to manipulate DNA and create viruses and all of that that only attack a certain group of people, a certain race or a certain, a certain group. That's kind of like the, the uh, mustard gas and all of that of World War I when they dumped it on the trenches over there and, and killed off those young men. It was trench warfare for a long time, World War I. And they outlawed it because it was so horrible. Uh, but you know, 
Murdering people is against the law. Does it stop them from murdering? You see what I mean? They can pass all the laws. I know this is a rabbit, but I want to give it to you. They can pass all the laws they want to about controlling guns. So murdering people is against the law, right? Well, do you think a, a murderer is going to what, listen to your law when it comes to buying a gun or acquiring a weapon? Well, of course not. And that's what we're getting to with, with this stuff. We're coming to the point to where all it takes is a rogue scientist wants the materials together, once they got it, to create a monster that you cannot imagine in your wildest dreams that humanity has to face. If uh, Revelation chapter 16 talks about a plague, it talks about boils, it talks about this stuff coming, coming on humanity. In the same chapter, Revelation 16, three unclean spirits like frogs go out of the mouth of the beast, false prophet, three unclean, in other words, demons, demonic. In plain words, he's trying to say that the spirit that energizes the whole human race in the tribulation period is demonic. You got to be ready for the demonic. Is the country ready for the demonic? Is the demonic... Uh, how many people do you think out there have the Holy Spirit in them? I think a small percentage. I think a small percentage. Alright, so what do we got here? A nanobot. We're already in the early stages of augmenting, replacing each of our organs even portions of our brains with neural implants, the most recent versions of which allow patients to download new software to their neural implants from outside their bodies. In the book I described how each of our organs will ultimately be replaced. For example, nanobots could deliver to our bloodstream an optimal set of all the nutrients, hormones, and other substances we need, as well as remove toxins and waste products. The gastrointestinal tract could be reserved for culinary pleasures rather than the tedious biological function of providing nutrients, so forth and so on. So what do you mean? I mean they can create a new body. They can create a new body. Amino acids create proteins. Proteins create tissue. Tissue creates organs. Organs create bodies. You're in a body. We know how the body's made now. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If God made a body and mankind makes a body, if he can make organs, he'll make a body. If he can download the mind, the mind, the brain, into this intelligence we're talking about, singularity, when we reach that point where he can take the brain and dump everything that's in the brain into a machine. And then he can replicate that machine everywhere. Then he can make bodies and he can put the brain and the machine together, the body together. Then you can have 15 or 20 of yourselves all over the world where nobody could ever do you in. If you got killed in a car wreck, you've also always got a backup. You say that, that's wild. This is what they're shooting for. Now, let's say there's 15 of you. <laughs> Which one is in the image of God? Which one has a soul? You say, wait a minute, preacher. They couldn't all have souls because there has to be a being somewhere. You got that right. The soul is your intellect, emotion, and will. Your soul is the part of you that can that that communicates with God, all right, in prayer and and, and, and in a wonderful way. Your spirit literally fellowships with God. The spirit of God and your, Holy, and your spirit through the Holy Spirit. You literally raise, you're, you raise to a level that, that human, you, you can't do physically. A human being can't do it. All right. You're in, commun you're in commune with, you're communicating with God. Now what's say if you're a machine? You've reached that point that I was telling you about at the beginning of this thing. Where you're no longer a human being. You're a machine. You may have your so-called eternal life. You may be able to live off into eternity like that. And I don't think that God will let that happen. I don't believe he'll let it happen. But Satan could stand and shake his fist at God and say, Now, look what happened. I took your highest creation. And man is, he's the last, final, highest 
Man was the, was, is, is the apex of the creation, nothing greater. He made the man. He says, I took your man and look what I've done to him. He's no longer the man you made, he's the man I made. Now, the battle rages. Now, I'm giving you quite a bit in here this morning, so think about it for a minute. Do you believe that they could ever reach that point of singularity where they could do that? This fellow, Kurzweil, he projects it to be about 20... Uh, 45. He thinks that in 25 years, and he says, and I may be wrong in the sense that exponential growth, you know, zoom, all of a sudden we reach a point where zoom, all of this starts happening. He says, it's going to happen. No question. This is going to happen. Now, what would the generation alive today, you young people, you're 17, 18, you know, 20 years for you, you'll be 38, 48. 20 years for me, I'm old. <laughs> Now, will you want to live forever in that flesh, in this body? Or is there anywhere in the world that you'd like to go be with the Lord? Is there ever a time that comes when, you, when, you, when you'd rather be with Him than to suffer in the flesh? That's the mark. Very possibly. So what do you mean? It may come to the point to where the mark... Now I'm saying possibly where the mark is when you make a choice between God or here, life forever, here. His name, his mark, and his number. The Bible says that the number of his name, that's gematria. I don't know his name. But once you get his name, the number of his name is 666. So whatever his name is, okay, his mark's one thing. The mark doesn't necessarily be 666. Read it carefully. But his name, his name, the gematria, in other words, the letters added up will come out to 666. Now there's two languages where there's no question that gematria applies. One is Hebrew, the other is Greek. We know that, no question about it. But in English, a lot of people have done this, and they've taken uh, A, for example, and made it to 1, B, 2, and so forth. I don't know about that. I'm not so quick to jump on that bandwagon because the English, we've got, lump, we've got numbers. We've got a numerical system. We don't need to take a letters of our alphabet and, and make them represent numbers. Some people do that, and I think that uh, I think that's okay. You, if you want to do that, all right, go ahead. But it doesn't, I'm not compelled to accept it. You see what I'm saying? It, okay, it may be all right, but I'm not compelled to accept it. But if, some, if somebody showed me a Hebrew name that added up to 666, I'd watch that name very closely and try to make all the connections with it. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, Nimrod and uh, others. And of course, Nimrod is a type of the Antichrist in a lot of different ways. He shows up over in the old, in the old Babylonian cuneiform. He's all over the place. Nimrod is. But are you, I want you to just get a hold of something in here this morning. I personally believe that we are much closer to, uh, to this becoming a reality than a lot of people do. I believe that what happened in Wuhan, China. Wuhan. Wuhan, China. If you want to do a little research into it, you might find it very interesting. For example, Wuhan, China is a city of, I think, about three million, one to three million, something like that. This place right here, this, this, uh, this laboratory, is next to a fish market. But you can come around from it, not too far, and there is a residence over there, an official type place, and I never could get it squared away, but something over there. And the location of that place is 666 Street, and it's connected with Wuhan. I thought, you know what? I believe God makes them stick that number on, 
whoever they are or whatever they're doing so that you can be warned that this is coming. Folks, the coronavirus may not be a worldwide pandemic. In other words, it's all over the world killing all of these millions of people. On the other hand, it may be. But the bottom line is it's a warning. God is a gracious God. He's merciful God. And I believe he warns people. He's not willing that any should perish. I believe it's a warning. And I believe that we would do well to, to keep our mind, keep our, keep our, uh, our attention focused on the latest technology coming out and what's, uh, what's happening around us. Now, if this and some of them accuse, there's a bunch of people over there that are accusing the United States of uh, fabricating this virus. They're accusing the U.S. and they say the U.S. did this so that it would create economic uh, chaos in China so that the United States would, would immediately wipe them and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, you know, the competition and take over in, in that area. And some of them on there are accusing U.S. of that. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. I don't think they say the CIA did it. And this is where you get into all kinds of conspiracy theories. But be careful. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter number 2, that there is a conspiracy. Remember that. Like I said about the news media earlier. They create a term, they demonize that term, and then they apply that term to anybody that doesn't agree with them. Okay? You watch the way they do this. It's amazing. I marvel at it. And you watch the news media, they'll come out and they'll all be talking about a certain thing. And first thing you know, CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, all the rest of them are using the same terminology. It's like they've read from the same playbook. That's what's happening. I'll give you this warning. Do not trust what the news media says. Don't trust them. Do not trust them. And... Uh, We'll pick it up again next week, Lord willing. Hopefully, I don't have you scared to death, but hopefully uh, you're uh, a little bit more aware now of where, along, where we are along the line. Hey, Amen. Yeah, yes. What do you think the actual thing's going on on the ship, the cruise ship? On that cruise ship in Japan, Yokohama? What was it? What was it? 300, 400 people infected, they said, with... with uh, with the coronavirus? Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, where all these, why? How'd they get, that's what you're, what you're asking is how so many people got infected on that one ship. That's a good question, brother. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to go back and check out where they'd been. And, uh, you know, all it takes is, I didn't mention this about the coronavirus, but I will, 14 days. You can go 14 days, show no symptoms with the coronavirus, but during that 14 day period, you're infecting people, okay? The virus itself, the coronavirus can live seven days on a surface, seven days. That's a long time, folks, that you can handle a doorknob or something like that and you can be infected. Seven days, it'll live, and 14 days with no symptoms. I don't know, it could have been one person, and since they were all kept in one place, you see what I mean? They were. It was, it's, it's like a mini laboratory. One person could have come on that ship infected and infected four or five hundred of them because all you've got to do is infect another one and it's exponential. See, it's exponential in the way it infects. Start with one, then you got two, then you got four, then you got eight, then you got 16, then you got 32, then you got 64, and you got 128, and all that within 24 hours or 48 hours. Worse on a person because their immune system and the body's worn down. That if the first one doesn't take you out, the second one will. Or yeah. A lot worse. Yeah. It's yeah. Very, very scary. Yes, it is. And they reported on the news yesterday a little 15 year old girl, just precious little girl, 15 years old. She was, uh, at Christmas time, she was, I think, perfectly healthy. And then she came down with a flu, and she was dead by New Year's. But it wasn't the coronavirus, it was just the flu. 
A lot of people die from flu. 15 years old, just a precious little girl. That's how fast you can leave this world. It's nothing to mess with. You know what, you know what all that means? If you ain't prayed up, you need to pray up. <laughs> Yeah, if you're not ready to meet the Lord, you need to make sure you are. <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. God bless you. Appreciate you listening. Amen. Brother Bobby Gaylor, will you dismiss us, please? Thank you, Lord, for this teaching. Thank you for today. Uh, bless the preaching to come in a few minutes. Thank you for our pastor that gives us the truth and tells us about things out there in the world that most folks won't talk about today. So our eyes are open. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.